Hi, I'm Tim. Welcome to Watchbox, and thanks for logging on. We have an incredible show for you today. Everything you see, of course, is for sale, and you can purchase at tmasso at thewatchbox.com. Prices, sales, trades, any inquiries you have about the watches you see here, reach out directly to me, tmasso at thewatchbox.com. Prices, where available, as well as references and model names are in the description below. Let's jump straight into two of a good thing. If a Blanc Pain 50 Fathoms is good, two is better. Now these are respectively my colleague Brandon's and my own favorite versions of the standard 45 millimeter watch. The timepiece on the right is the blue matte titanium model that debuted at Basel World 2017. This is my favorite version of the watch. A matte case, a little bit more discreet and much lighter than the standard polished steel and titanium. It's still 45 millimeters, but it features a blue dial, metallic, and a lovely glossy sapphire capped bezel with one of the best detents you will encounter in the business. Let's have a listen against the mic. Precise 120 clicks and of course fully loomed. Now when you turn this one over, it's a bit different than a standard 5015 because like the bathyscaphe, it features a silicon hairspring, so there's no need for the soft iron cage around the whole movement. As a result, you can see the five-day automatic winding free sprung, high horology and high horology finished caliber 1315. 300 meters water resistant, this would be my choice among the standard 45 millimeter 50 fathoms. But there's the reference 5050, the grand date. A timepiece that arrived in 2018, it too is 45 millimeters in matte finished titanium, so nice and discreet compared to the polished steel standard watch, it's also nice and light. Now we'll get a little bit closer and you can see the namesake of the watch, it's on the dial side. Double digits with a quick set, every other regard is identical functionally. Silicon hairspring, display case back, high horology finish, five day power reserve, anti-magnetic, very durable, very handsome, and you are getting the old ultimate high horology dive watch here. I would say its only true rival in terms of finery is the Debetun DB28 Grand Bleu Diver. That is a watch that is immaculately hand finished inside and out, and so are these. And because these are easily the best loom shots of the show, you're getting the best front loaded today. We're going for the loom shot. Or I should say, loom shots. Okay, there they are. As you can see, UFOs by night. This is as good as it gets from the standpoint of a dive watch. Both bezels are fully loomed because the luminous paint is capped and covered by the cambered sapphire tops. Let there be light. Okay, let's jump straight into something cool and a little bit offbeat. I just mentioned my favorite independent brand. And here it is in the metal. Debatoun of La Berson, making 150 watches each year under the aegis of watchmaking maestro and scientist Denis Flageolet. 42 millimeters in titanium grade 5. This particular model is the DB25 Starry Varius, but it's a special five piece limited edition for 2019. As a result, instead of the silver chaptering outboard for the hours, you could see that there is a matching fired blue titanium chaptering with rose gold hour indices. Now, at the center, you can see there is both gold leaf flaked across to create the band of the Milky Way and individual red gold cabochon placed onto the dial. You can also see that there is a paucity of branding on this dial. In fact, that's the only text whatsoever. Now, the timepiece is thin, and unlike the DB28s here, the lugs are conventional, so the watch wears easily on the wrist. Throwing it on the wrist, you can see the timepiece is nice and flat. This isn't big and ungainly. Some of the DB28 pieces with their floating lugs are a bit too out there for some, so with the cleanliness of the dial, the thin case, and the conventional lugs. This is the Debatoon for most. Again, they're only making 150 pieces a year, and of this model, five pieces crafted. Now you can see the caliber 2115, all black polished steel bridges and plates visible to you, along with a patented double mainspring system, six day power reserve, manual wind, patented triple shock protection. You can see the springs on the flanks of the balance bridge, patented flat hairspring, balance, and their own silicon unlubricated escape wheel. All of this giving you tremendous chronometric precision and durability. And again, the amount of R&D that goes into each watch from this company is astounding given their absolute volume. Let me throw one of those 50 fathoms on the wrist real quick. 
feel like I baited and I switched you without giving you a wrist shot. There you go, my wrist 16 centimeters in circumference. You can see how the 5050 wears in grade five titanium. Handsome piece. All right, back with Starfleet in the meantime. The Debatoon DBS launched in 2005 in its original version. This model is platinum, 42.5 millimeters, but there is some witchcraft going on with the dimensions of this watch. Because of the double hinge lugs, the timepiece is only 46 millimeter from lug to lug, and you can see the lugs are asymmetrical. Uh, very different from anything else, including their own floating lug profile. This is part of the evolution of the Debatoon case shape, and you can see it features many of their characteristic design elements, including the triple sho parachute shock protection, the twin mainspring barrels, the six day power reserve and we'll get a little bit close here and you can see close to the dial the fired steel side of the white palladium and blue fired steel spherical moon face which has an adjustment interval of 1000 years actually a little bit more than that now the timepiece is a bullhead winder but it's much easier to wind this one than it is the db28 because the bullhead is completely exposed so there's no trouble actually getting to the crown you'll note the attention to detail on the crown the combination of black polish knurling and then drilling that's just the crown the dial side which is black feature Features vertical coat de Bethune over the delta shaped, some will say Starfleet inspired center bridge that covers the barrels. You have the same combination of patented hairspring, the same combination of proprietary shock protection and balance. And of course, on the reverse side, you have a power reserve indicator for the six day manual wind power reserve. The watch features a matching platinum buckle, and when you throw it on the wrist, it is quite substantial, though only 11 millimeters thick, so it sits low, and you can see this really is a watch that could be your dress watch. Somehow only 46 millimeters across the wrist, despite being a 42 and a half in diameter. Again, this timepiece is astounding in its ergonomics, incredibly comfortable, incredibly massive in full platinum, and also incredibly I would have to say intricate in a way that few watches are, even in the independent realm. All of the action is on the dial side, no need to look at the case back. Now, if you want all your action on the dial side, it doesn't get much better than a meteorite dial. This Rolex 116519 in white gold is quite literally out of this world with a Gambian sourced meteorite dial. And as you can see, a combination of white gold applique, Roman numerals, and red lacquered hands with that shock of Daytona red across the six o'clock register for constant seconds. A handsome timepiece on a full strap from Rolex. It's 100 meters water resistant, but you need textile in order to wear it that way. As you can see, the condition is excellent with the original sticker, and I'll do my best to get a little bit closer here, but with the original sticker and reference number still visible on the case back, this is a mid-2000s D-series watch with the three-day power reserve, vertical clutch column wheel, chronometer, in-house caliber 4130. It's a good looking piece, 12.2 millimeters thick. It's nice, flat and flush to the wrist. If you don't like the conformity of the Rolex brand and they do all sort of look the same, I'm not gonna lie. Uh, get away from the Clone Wars with this timepiece right here. A watch that is quite like, well, nothing else in the Rolex catalog is the meteorite dial, the combination of the silver, the red, the applique radially arrayed Romans. And of course that lovely graceful Daytona case is the key to giving this watch an independence and an identity that stands apart from the conventional rotating bezel Rolex sports watches. This is one of the best versions of the Daytona of all time, and I love the combination of the white gold bezel with the white gold case. It is a perfect match. If you want rarity, you can still have it in the form of a traditional rotating bezel Rolex sports watch. This is the 116600, originally launched to great acclaim in 2014. For the most part, it didn't sell well because many decided that for the price premium, they may as well just buy the Submariner, which looks almost identical, or the Deep Sea, which is clearly a bigger and more expensive looking watch. Let's say this one was a bit too cerebral. It was also scarce, rarely ordered, and for only three model years from 14 through 16, this has already become a collectible modern day Rolex. Steel, dive watch, Rolex, and rare. The ingredients for an all-time great and a surefire collectible. Now the timepiece, of course, is everything a Rolex diver should be. It features a combination of the 20 millimeter 10 increment glide lock system that you get on the Submariner, but you also get a flip lock fold-out extension for over 50 millimeters of total adjustment, or for those of us in the colonies, two inches. This is a timepiece that wears like a sub without any of the ungainly mass of the deep sea, while still giving you immense capability in the form of the clasp, the 4,000 foot dive 
depth, and as you can see on the flank, the helium escape valve. It features no Cyclops eye, and I have to say, I like it that way. A cleaner dial in a 40 millimeter Rolex sports watch, it's not even appreciably thicker than the sub when on the wrist. Chronometer certified, of course, mechanically it's identical to the older deep sea in the sub, but externally quite a bit to set it apart, especially in terms of the diving refinements and the rarity. A real cool piece from Rolex, and the best way to get a non-generic Rolex diver. But for many, Rolex is all about dials, and in the modern era, one of the most beloved is the Wimbledon dial. This is a timepiece that, of course, is the second generation big date just, a date just 41, the 126300 with three day power reserve, 100 meters water resistant, all stainless steel, and the Wimbledon dial. Those lovely lacquered green Roman numerals radially arrayed, the single luminescent index at nine o'clock, and then you have a lovely dark rhodium dial. This is Rolex's take on rhodium, normally a silvery material that you see on the case backs of display case back Swiss watches. Here, it's layered on thick to give it a nickel anthracite aesthetic that's a lot more like ruthenium, a very slick watch. It wears easily, though it is substantial. At 41 millimeters with solid end links, I'd have to say it wears a little bit like a 42 or even a 43. It has a lot of wrist presence, but it's not not thick, which gives it a viability with dress attire that, for example, some of the larger Rolex watches, the 42s, the 43s, and the 44s don't always have. So there's wrist presence here, but there's also versatility and elegance. This is a great way to go if you want a Rolex watch with one of the best known modern Rolex dials and one that's anything but generic with a little splash of color. And hey, green on a watch is always becoming. I think there should be more of them. Now let's talk about a timepiece that is anything but your average F.P. Journe. Now F.P. Journe, of course, in 2013 celebrated 30 years since he built his first pocket watch in 1983. This watch is the Tourbillon 30 years anniversary, better known as the T30. Now it's an interesting combination of two things rarely seen in tandem. On wristwatches, the use of rose gold is hardly out of the norm, but sterling silver 925, now there is something uncharacteristic. Also, most F.P. Journe watches for automatics and manual wine dress watches tend to be fairly generic in their shape. With a guilloche cut case flank and a hunter case back, this watch is anything but. The contrast between the already patinaed sterling silver and the rose gold is exquisite. And if you wonder why does silver and inert metal patina, it's because sterling silver is actually 6% copper, and thus the copper is what creates the tarnish and the change in color over time. Now the dial evokes the first F.P. Journe pocket watch, which is why it looks a little bit like a Jacques Dreau from the front. You'll note that Journe's characteristic dial side bolts are present and correct. Both of them fired blue. It even has a little bit of the look of a vintage Breguet pocket watch, and that was indeed the idea behind the early Journe pocket watches, and thus the idea behind this wristwatch. 40 millimeters in diameter, it features a display case back of extraordinary aesthetic, as this is anything but your characteristic Journe movement. Now what you're looking at is rose gold, but finished in the fashion of a pocket watch, specifically an early Journe pocket watch, albeit to a much higher standard. Bridges and plates are still rose gold, but with a frosted finish, you can see the mirrored anglage on the edge of the bridges. You'll also note that the screws are absolutely colossal here. Gargantuan, fired blue, very very special with an enormous tourbillon cage. You can see just how broad it is with black polished arms across both sides continuously rounded. At the top you can see black polished caps atop the twin suspended mainspring barrels and I like the fact that there's a gorgeous symmetry about this movement that you don't conventionally find on F.P. Journe calibers. It has a free sprung architecture with an overcoil and you rarely see an overcoil on a Journe watch save for only the special pieces and with only 99 made of which this this Guilloche case back is number 27. This is a very special Journe watch and actually one of my favorites. I've seen the T10, but the T30's combination of rose gold and sterling silver actually endears it to me more. You can see an easy fit on the wrist and very comfortable. This is a timepiece that's a little bit stealthy because people don't immediately register it as a Journe. If you're a Journe collector looking to complete the collection that has everything or you're getting into the brand and you want something a little bit different, this is the way to go. One of the all-time greats from one of the all-time great independent watchmakers. That said, the Vacabondage 2 of 2010, 69 pieces 
in platinum represents what is probably my favorite version of this timepiece. Now I have to say, all things considered, there are three Vagabondage models. There's the one, the two, and the three. And a lot of people are taken by the rarity of the one and the jumping seconds of the three. But I like the double jumping indications of the two with the jump hour and the jump minutes. It's also a fascinating watch because there's a trick of the eye here. At first glance, it appears orderly and symmetrical. But when you get closer to the dial, you realize that the bridge covering the seconds, the minutes, and the hours is highly asymmetrical and off-centered. You'll also note that it features a lovely vertical set and finish that matches the top of the bezel. There's a power reserve at 12 o'clock, and then you've got a smoked sapphire showing the movement itself, which is made of rose gold. I like this one a lot better than the three. For me, it's where it's at, and with this combination of a Jean Rousseau Parisian double alligator leather strap and the platinum case, it's a very special looking watch. 8.2 millimeters thick, it's ultra thin given the complexity, and it's 45.3 millimeters from lug to lug and about 38 millimeters across, so any wrist can wear this one easily, comfortably, and with great style. Again, only 69 made in platinum, so this is a very special piece. The original Vagabondage was made for a charity auction associated with Anticorum, and it used a movement that Jorn had developed previously for a jumping hour Cartier Tour 2. That defined the ultimate shape of the Vagabondage series, because Cartier never used that movement. But because the early versions weren't as accurate, the Vagabondage 1 was not what Jorn would call a chronometer. He did not want to put his name on the front, and so it is on the Vagabondage 2 and 3, even though they have superb chronometric properties, the traditions of the series have been respected. You have a properly shaped and sized, Tour 2 shaped rose gold movement, and of course, this is a timepiece with enormous charisma. Not just collectability, but a watch with a lot of charm and presence. If I'm not finishing the show with a minute repeater, can you imagine where this episode's gonna go? We're talking about the 2008 to present Repetition Souverain. 40 millimeters in stainless steel. This is how F.P. Jorn does a multiply patented minute repeater. You can see the dial is much like a CS. It features power reserve that chronometer style indicates zero when fully wound. You have the black polished strikers visible through the dial, and then you have a simple three-hand time display. Of course, you have the blue printing because this is a special watch, and you're supposed to know that at a glance. Being stainless steel and with a full deployment clasp, you already know this is an unusual piece from F.P. Jorn. One of the patents, of course, is for the scythe-shaped chimes, and the other is for a compact rack and snail. So you wind up with an ultra-flat 8.7 millimeter thick minute repeater. Now let's set this one to 12 minutes and 59 seconds, and I'll do my best to hit that on the nose. A Little bit of action from our first responders outside, keeping us safe. All right. Hopefully I nailed that. As ever, you have a rose gold movement, twin mainspring barrels, 56 hour power reserve, six position adjustment, and a free sprung balance. Throw it on the wrist, it's comfortable, it's compact, it's not even terribly heavy. In stainless steel, it is the connoisseur's choice of metals, scratch resistant in a way that no gold or platinum watch ever could be, and it's low in profile. It declares itself, but not boisterously. This is a timepiece that I could wear every day. If you're gonna buy just one watch from F.P. Jorn and you've got the budget to match your ambitions, this is a great way to go. A watch that doesn't need loom because you can hear the time at night. This is truly one of the most, I would say, special pieces and one of the watches that possesses a distinct sense of occasion wherever it goes. Always the life of the party or a red bar. I like special editions and landmark pieces, and for Patek Philippe, the advanced research series of the 2000s certainly meets each mark. 300 pieces, 39 millimeters in platinum. This is the Patek Philippe 5450P annual calendar. Lovely salmon dial with blackened numerals and indices and leaf hands to match. This timepiece was part of the advanced research series that incorporated silicon-based technologies, starting with the 5250 and an escape wheel, 
we ultimately wound up with the entire advanced research series of silicon components. And I'm going to do my best to show you right here, but you can see it says Pulsamax on the escape wheel and terminal train bridge. And then it says advanced research on the case back with a built-in loop. So you can more easily appreciate the Pulsamax full silicon escapement. That's the anchor and the wheel, as well as the Spiromax anti-magnetic silicon hairspring. That's right, a watch with a built-in loop. These are supremely collectible. Owning all four of the silicon series is one of the top ambitions of the most committed Patek collectors and this is an annual calendar the signature Patek Philippe complication that they invented and patented back in 1996 the watch features a matching full platinum deployment clasp 300 pieces for 2008 and as you can see it's a compact and comfortable watch with a diamond set between the lugs as Patek platinum watches are wont to do comfortable and not excessively broad across the wrist it does feel substantial all in platinum but it's the charisma of that salmon dial rare then and very much one of the styles du jour of the present age uh, a handsome look with platinum and a versatile watch that's equal measures elegant and sporty so you can wear it absolutely anywhere. Also an historically important piece for Patek Philippe as well as the industry. 16 centimeters circumference wrist and it'll wear on a small wrist down to 13 and a half centimeters circumference. Now this is my favorite 5170. The 5170 bout is a yellow gold watch back at Basel World in 2010, and that initial version with Roman numerals, silver dial, and a yellow gold case was, well, elegant, but didn't feel contemporary. It didn't have a visual, visceral punch like the 5070s did. By 2017, with the 5170P, Patek had corrected, and this watch is a hell of a course correction. As you can see, you start with the diamond between the lugs because this 39.7 millimeter, or I should say 39.4 millimeter case in platinum has the characteristic diamond display, but it has more. It has baguette diamonds set as the indices for the hours, giving the watch a wonderful three-dimensional loft to its dial, as well as a richness rarely seen even on Patek models. Now, it's a gradient blue, just like the Nautilus, but more intense. A sunburst that fades from a sort of cobalt blue at the center to almost black navy at the edge. All white calibrations, it looks the business on any wrist. Now, when you turn it over, of course, you have the in-house caliber 29530 PS. It is a 65-hour manual wind, lateral clutch, column wheel, instantaneous jumping minute chronograph, six-position adjustment, overcoil hairspring made by hand with a free-sprung gyromax style balance, and the timepiece features a instantaneous minute jumper that uses a small paw wheel and ratchet underneath the chronograph bridge, a very special movement that's larger than the previous Le Mania CH27 base. You can see as we get towards the index, I'm going to show you how the instantaneous jump occurs from the reverse side because it's part of the theater, the pomp and circumstance of owning this watch. You have that instantaneous minute jump, and we'll see that happen in just a second. And there it is right there. You also note that there's a black polished cap to the column wheel, a fully jeweled lateral clutch, and you can see that there are multiple mirrored bevels on the edge of the steel chronograph components as well as the bridges themselves. Of course, it is a modern Patek in-house caliber, so it also features hacking seconds. It is the full package. On the wrist, it wears easily. Again, 39.4 millimeters and nice and flat, less than 12 millimeters thick, it wears underneath any cuff. And with the combination of the dark dial and the white metal, it is a viable sports watch. This is as good as Patek Philippe engineering and finish gets. And if you're wondering why it doesn't have a vertical clutch, well, let me show you the case back one more time. Why would you want the clutch to be hidden when it looks this good? Also, at Patek, higher level watchmakers work on the lateral clutch systems. They are considered to be more intricate, more difficult to tune, and as a result, more artisanal. That is the reason you want a lateral clutch. A late addition to the Holy Trinity, we'll have to call it a quartet, Alonga Unzona of Saxony has been doing incredible things since 1994 when the first four models dropped at Dresden Castle. What you see here is possibly the best new watch of 2009. This is the Richard Lange Pour le Merite, a 200-piece limited edition in red gold with a grand faux enamel multi-piece dial. It is a truly special and subtle timepiece. 40.5 millimeters as my calipers measure it. 
It features the extraordinary caliber L044. Let's get a little bit closer. It's not just that it is beautiful. That goes without saying. It's not just that it features not one, but two freehand engraved half bridges. It's the fact that it features a 636 part chain as a component of the fuse and chain constant force device, which for 36 hours ensures the same amount of force is delivered to the escapement, even as the mainspring barrel wears down. Now you can see that chain, which is 20 centimeters long and capable of suspending two kilograms, despite being only one quarter of a millimeter thick, as I wind, it winds from the barrel to the fusee, and you can see there's a differential on the top of the fusee that allows me to wind the watch without cutting off torque to the escapement. And you can see both components rolling as the chain, bicycle style, moves from one to the other. And that is how it works, like bicycle gears. As the mainspring barrel wears down, the chain winds up pulling a larger circumference, increasing the mechanical advantage of the diminishing mainspring to maintain constant amplitude and thus very precise timing. You'll also note that there is tremendous hand finished visible underneath the three-quarter style bridge and many, many black polished components on this case back. You can see them turning black. Let's take a quick look on my wrist, by the way. Yes, this is probably my favorite rose gold watch of all time. And I've seen it in platinum and I've seen the later white gold model with the black dial. I would take this one for its warmth and the elegance of that dial against that case. Easy to wear on a small wrist. This is an all-arounder. A dress watch, yes, but don't hesitate to wear it with short sleeves. The timepiece has a casual ease about it that makes it viable everywhere except in the water, and you know I'd wear it everywhere except in the water. That said, some folks prefer white metal cases. And for those, there is the Boutique Edition 1815 Flyback Chronograph, 39.5 millimeters in white gold. This was launched back in 2015. The revival of the 1815 Chronograph in 2010 left some people cold. A lot of folks were missing the outboard scale of the earlier model that ran from 2004 to 2008, while Longo went a big way towards pleasing the traditionalists when it launched this boutique model, which first has that endearing pulsation scale or pulse scale outboard, but it also features blue printing. How can you tell the difference easily between this and the first generation watch? Well, polished hands rather than blued hands, but this watch has a few advantages over the original. The flyback chronograph caliber, which is the L9515, I believe, has a 60 hour power reserve rather than the 36 hour power reserve of the original. It's also a lot thinner than a datagraph as it features an 11.3 millimeter thickness, the datagraph is about two millimeters more, and yet you give up nothing on the reverse side because the movement is just as beautiful. Now here we have a lot going on. You saw the Patek earlier, and you can see Lanka does things a little bit differently. Look at the number of interior angles just on the steel lateral clutch alone, and then think of how difficult it would have been to finish those sharp inward clefts on a steel component rather than brass or German silver. And by the way, the rest of the movement sans chronograph components is German silver. The nickel copper zinc alloy that has a golden hue because of the copper. You can see the freehand engraved half bridge for the balance and the overcoil hairspring that's used on this balance beating away at 18,000 vibrations per hour. Most Longa watches do not feature a handmade overcoil, so this timepiece exquisitely specced, not just aesthetically, but also technically. Now the 39.5 millimeter case wears easily, flat, flush, comfortable, and handsome. This is a versatile watch, as most Longa timepieces are, though they're a bit anachronistic in their style and they almost seem to channel the pocket watch era of the 19th century and early 20th century in eastern Germany. Nevertheless, they still manage to uh, speak to a joie de vivre and a love of life that is often associated with the French Swiss watchmakers, but somehow Longa, in spite of its Teutonic precision and engineering ethic, also has a lot of life, character, and color to its watches, and this watch is emblematic of that. Blancpain, you are so much more than a dive watch company. And thanks to this Le Mans Tourbillon Automatic, I have the proof. We saw the chronograph on the last show, but this watch might be even better. A flying tourbillon designed for Blancpain by Vincent Calabrese, co-founder of the AHCI, and without saying, he's a member. It features a black polished flying tourbillon up at 12 o'clock, a loomed dial, 
an 80 to 100 meter water resistant case and an eight day power reserve. Take a look at that tourbillon. You could see that it essentially propels itself alongside an underlying gear. So it drives itself around that platform without an upper bridge. And you can see that the tourbillon carriage itself is black polished. Without the upper bridge, it is a flying tourbillon, so very visible. You'll note there is an eight day power reserve indicator. There is a date indicator. And the watch is only 11 millimeters thick, despite being almost 100 meters water resistant and 43.5 millimeters lug to lug which means it's an absolute gem that works well on any wrist size graceful and rose gold you turn it over and you realize how special the caliber 25 is take a look at that bridge on the underside of the tourbillon look at how thin the components are bracing the tourbillon structure look at the breadth of the beveled edges. They're so broad, you don't even need a loop to appreciate this movement. It's adjusted in five positions, and as you can see, it features a freehand engraved yellow gold rotor. So no two of these exactly alike. Engine turning on the base plate with a Cote de Genève across the spare winding bridge. This is a very, very impressive timepiece. And as you can see, number 18, they don't make a lot of these. This is a great value in complication as you're gonna get into this watch for under $30,000. That really doesn't even buy you a full bracelet white gold Daytona anymore. And you're getting something that represents a peer to the best from Langa, Vacheron. Jager Lecoult, Patek Philippe, and Audemars Piguet. Heck, it's a neighbor to the likes of Audemars Piguet, Breguet, and Jager Lecoult, as these are made in Les Brassus in the Valley du Jeu, and they are made in the finest tradition of the Valley du Jeu. Philippe Dufour would be proud, or perhaps I should say, Vincent Calabrese. I'm an Omega man, always have been. My first luxury watch was inherited from my grandfather. It was a DeVille Seamaster, a water resistant dress watch. My first watch that was acquired by means other than inheritance was my graduation watch, an Omega Seamaster Diver 300 meter. And for 2018, Omega reimagined its most important modern design. A long term staple in the collection, this design is often known as the James Bond because of its halcyon days on the wrist of 007 in the Pierce Brosnan era, but it's so much more. 42 millimeters in combination of titanium, tantalum, and rose gold. This was a 2,500 piece limited edition launched for the redesign of the watch in 2018. 2,500 pieces made in tribute to a 1993 chronograph model that like this watch featured the tritone combination. Now it's special in more ways than its limited edition and its combination of metals. As you can see, the style, which is titanium, features no date. That's highly non-standard for this series, but it's also less cluttered and more handsome. You'll note that the bezel is that mysterious blue-gray tantalum material, and then the center links of the sandwich of rose gold, titanium, and tantalum are in fact that same satin finished tantalum metal. So you have a combination of titanium, rose gold, and then tantalum center links on a bracelet that includes a number of refinements, making this perhaps the best equipped diver 300 meter ever. It features a fold-out dive extension. Note the use of ceramic spring-loaded pin snaps, but you also get a push-button slider mechanism so you can make incremental adjustments over about 10 millimeters of adjustable track. If you want to use it as a dive extension, that's great. If you just want to use it to size for fit, that's also good. The timepiece is 13.7 millimeters thick, so not excessively thick. It's 300 meters water resistant with the helium escape valve. And as you can see, the watch received a new movement for 2018, the 55 hour power reserve METAS or master chronometer caliber 8806. The 06 indicating this is the no date model. 55 hour power reserve coaxial chronometer, 300 meters water resistant, a special edition a limited edition, and one hell of a wrist presence. I'm not necessarily a colored gold guy, but every once in a while, I do fall for a good rose gold and white metal two-tone. This is not just rose gold and white metal. It's rose gold, gray, and blue metal. And thanks to the presence of the gold and the tantalum, the watch doesn't feel toy-like the way titanium watches often can on the wrist. 50 meters lug to lug with pivoted end links. It wears well on a wrist as small as 13 and a half centimeters circumference. You're gonna like the way it looks and you're gonna like the way it feels. Now, I kind of figured the Diver 300 meter thing was done after 2018, at least for a while. But in January of 2019, Omega came back and stunned me with a watch that might have been the best of the series. 43.5 millimeters in black ceramic with titanium trim and a no-date dial. This is the Diver 300 meter black ceramic. A handsome watch with a ceramic dial that features a bit of an inverse finish compared to the standard watch, which features polished waves and then satin finished 
shall we call them, troughs between the waves. This one actually features polished crests, and then the waves themselves are matte finished. The bezel is titanium, grade two, and brushed, with a ceramic insert that features cold enamel filled for the indications. So you have that cold enamel fill, the titanium, and the ceramic all on one bezel. Let's hear the bezel detent. The Current Diver 300 meter has the best bezel feel and the lowest bezel effort of any version of this watch. Now, one element of detail that I love is that Omega goes all the way, giving you both a ceramic buckle and a ceramic pin, so these conventional casualties of desk diving scratches under your wrist are just as scratch resistant as the case. Now, the timepiece, as you can see, is big, broad, and there's a bunch of stupid stickers on the back, so you can't see the movement, but it's the same on the last watch, so take my word for it. A very special timepiece on the wrist, big, broad, but not too large. Thanks to the titanium and the ceramic, it wears lighter than the standard steel 42 millimeter timepiece, and it's still low enough to fit underneath almost all cuffs with a comfortable and conforming strap that you can see leaves no daylight at the end where it abuts the case. It has the same handsome integration that you see on the full bracelet model. Let's do a wrist shot in the dark. Here comes a loom shot. There you can see Omega does loom the right way on these divers. There's a loom seconds hand, as all divers should have, and then you can see that the bezel pearl as well as the minute hand are green, so that they can easily be told apart from the remainder of the dial at night. This is ideal if you are using the watch as a backup dive timer. You know it's a good day when this isn't my closer. This is the Grubel Forcey Double Balancier, a timepiece launched in 2016. It features twin inclined balances, beating away at 21,600 vibrations per hour, overcoil hairsprings on both, and then a special planetary style differential that averages the error between the two. And that's the thing. Because they are in opposed poising, just sitting still, they are in different orientations relative to each other. When you turn one in a certain direction such that it speeds up, the other one is gonna be inclined because it's in a opposing position to slow down. As a result, in almost every position, you're going to find that the average of the two equates to zero timing error due to gravity, effectively giving you an instantaneous response to gravitational deviation that serves the same historic purpose as a tourbillon, but more effectively and more quickly in a wristwatch format. Let's talk about the special elements of this watch that set it apart from a conventional timepiece. First, it's 43.5 millimeters in diameter, and Remarkably for a Grubel 4C, only 13.3 millimeters thick. Now, if you look at case construction at Grubel, it's perhaps the most undersung element of their design and engineering. With these lovely concave mirror profiled lugs, a sharp break between the satin finish of the case and the black polish of the lug, and then a lovely disparity between the satin mid-case and the overlapping polished lip of the bezel and the case back. Now the timepiece is baroque in finish and deep with a wonderful depth of field that allows you to see through the movement, not just onto it. 8.15 millimeters thick and all of that so you can better see and appreciate the mechanical elements. Getting really close, by the way, 72 hour power reserve. There's a power reserve indicator. You can see that there is a constant second sub-register. You can also appreciate the fact that there is a running indicator above the differential itself that lets you know it's working. Now the timepiece, of course, features a set of oversized luminescent hands, so it is visible at night. And I'm actually gonna back them off for a moment and show you the remarkable six interior angles within the bridge, the black polished bridge, take note, that supports the hands at center. Everything you see here is the best available. No expenses spared. Grubel Forcey and Le Chaux de Fonds has 100 people making 100 watches a year. You will not find that ratio of employees to watches made anywhere else in the industry. Turn it all over and you can see it's beautifully made, but all the action is on the dial side, and that's one of the privileges of owning this watch. You need not flip it to enjoy the movement, so to speak. All the action is on the front side. This is a contemporary take not just on wristwatch precision but also on a number of pocket watch finishing techniques as the materials the finishing style even some of the architecture is borrowed from the La Chaux de Fonds pocket watch history that precedes Grubel Forcey. 
Robert Grubel and Stephen Forsey, formerly of Audemars Piguet, Renault et Papy, and Complétime, their own company, have a tremendous regard for tradition. If you want a no-compromise watch in this day and age, Grubel Forsey, Philippe Dufour, Hajime Aseoka, those type of sole proprietors, you know, Grubel is the only I would mention in those, in those ranks. Among the one-pop shops, this is the only serial producer that deserves to be mentioned alongside. All right, back in 2000, Vacheron celebrated the new millennium with this, the first ever in-house caliber Vacheron. This is the Malt Tourbillon, a timepiece from the Malt collection with the characteristic tonneau case. The Malt Tourbillon tonneau features the Vacheron caliber 1790, which references the first year the Maltese cross was used in a Vacheron timepiece, a clock as it happened. Now the watch is 36 millimeters wide by 48 millimeters lug to lug by only 11.8 millimeters thick, so it's not as big as it looks. It's not an ungainly giant Franck Muller. This is a timepiece that is one of those gods in the details type watches. It has a power reserve, it has a date, and as you can see, the tourbillon carriage featuring the Maltese cross is chock a block with interior angles. You can see there are 16 of them on the tourbillon carriage by itself, and note that immaculate mirrored black polish. Now you can find more sharp angles where the rounded portion of the upper tourbillon bridge meets the center, and then when you turn the watch over, by the way, that is real rose lathe guilloche on the dial, not stamped. You turn the watch over in the caliber 17 1990. Oh my god, let's count the interior angles. The single hardest act of finishing, manually finishing, an haute de gamme timepiece, the interior angles. And we can see 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16 on the reverse side of the watch, combined with the 16 on the tourbillon carriage. No one executes more, except maybe Parmigiani. This is as good as it gets. This will blow you away. A dial that is both rayon, sunburst guilloche, and sunburst satin finished from the Canon Pinion. It is the best of the best, featuring the 45-hour manual wind caliber 1790 developed by Vacheron in conjunction with the manufacturer Haute de Gamme out of the Valley de Jeu that Vacheron purchased in the late 1990s to help it get off the ground with its first generation of in-house calibers. And this one, as good as it gets, as rare as it gets, and truly as historically important as a milestone watch can be for a brand, and not just any brand, but one of the cornerstone brands in Swiss high horology dating back to 1755, never out of business is always producing watches and the oldest to be able to say it has continuously done so. It's holy trinity, but it's more. This is one of the most important watches in the history of Vacheron Constantin, dating back to 1755. And as you can see, it wears easily on a smaller wrist. If you like this watch, if you like any of these watches, email me, tmasso at thewatchbox.com. Your direct purchase question and query line for any watch you see here. Prices, references, names in the description. Time out, Tim out, and thanks for logging on.